evening everyone uh, jai bhim lal salam uh, i welcome you all on behalf of democratic students federation jnu like we have, uh, we have organized this talk uh, uh, to commemorate the 96th birth anniversary of uh, comrade sharad patil which was last week actually on friday uh, so so the like the there was some scheduling difficulties so we were not able to like sh schedule the talk on the last week uh, or on the on the date of birth itself uh, so like uh, so after sh uh, like scheduling the date we thought of organizing it this on tuesday uh, so <clears throat> the the, uh, the the topic of the today's talk is struggle uh, uh, like struggle against caste and capitalism the uh, in understanding the political philosophy of Co comrade sharad patil uh, as you might be knowing uh, comrade sharad patil is quite well known in maharashtra in, in the social circles and the social movements in maharashtra uh, but like if you come in like um, the in the northern parts of india or even in the academic circles uh, in here even in jnu uh, is uh, i don't think is like quite well known um, in academic circles in jnu uh, so so our purpose for organizing this talk was to introduce uh, the legacy of comrade sharad patil the uh, his thought process like uh, to uh, to jnu community and uh, to most of all the like students here and the most, uh, many of them are politically active so we, we wanted to introduce uh, comrade sharad patil and his thought to the to the audience here so that was the one purpose of organizing this talk and it's like uh, frankly even we haven't been able to like go through a lot of his literature uh, so so we thought it, uh, this will also be a good learning experience for us as well uh, so this was one of the reason and like uh, we want uh, even uh, when was uh, when it was his death a uh, death anniversary we wanted to uh, schedule his talk uh, uh, professor umesh bagade's talk but then again there was some scheduling difficulties and finally we were able to schedule it today uh, so like um, uh, uh you uh, like there's a uh, like there's a vast legacy of comrade sharad patil in maharashtra there's a he was not just an intellectual but he also participated in social movements he was uh, an like kind of organic intellectual who himself participated in people's struggles um, and like he, there's a broad like timeline of his activity and like uh, he has contributed to a lot of um, uh, his contributions uh, is uh, spread among various uh, streams and like, like uh, so like it's a um, I think uh, we have got a very good speaker who uh, who is like uh, very well versed with uh, uh, Comrade Sarath Patil's legacy, Professor uh, Umesh Bagade. Uh, he's like a, a lecture a chairperson of uh, history department uh, in uh, Bamu, Aurangabad, uh, and so he has been uh, he has wrote many books on caste caste analysis and uh, and the, and the related topics. Uh, uh, and along with him, we also have our own uh, very own Sharad Bhaviskar sir. Uh, he's quite well known among JNU fraternity, among students here. And so, like, we are very glad that both of us joined, uh, readily agreed to join us today at very short notice. Uh, so, like, uh, the the format we'll be following today is this: like, uh, after this, like, my short introduction, uh, Sharad Bhaviskar sir will be uh, giving his opening remarks of the chair's opening remarks. Uh, followed by uh, speaker's talk, which will be around 35 to 40 minutes. And then again, it will follow with the uh, chair's concluding remarks, again, for 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, we'll just conclude with a short Q&A session for like possibly 10 minutes. Uh, so like without much uh, delay, I will be handing over to Professor uh, Sharad Bhaviskar, sir, uh, to st start the session and initiate his remarks. Uh, thank you. Like Over to you, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sajid. Uh, and it's, I mean, I, I thank all of you and DSF for organizing this uh, important event uh, because due to lockdown and prior to lockdown, due to uh, our JNU crisis, the discursive uh, space has been completely uh, uh, smothered and, and now a lockdown has added to it. So this uh, event contributes to our tradition, our uh, JNU culture of discussion, debate. And in uh, for that, I really thank uh, DSF. Uh, and coming to the topic uh, that, you know, Comrade Sharad Patil, I mean, uh, he, I'm also from the same place, same town where he's from, uh, Dhule, but uh, frankly speaking, I didn't know about him. So I would slightly differ, uh, and that means he's not that well known uh, in that sense of the term. He's well known uh, uh, in kind of you know some circles, and then as an organizer, he's known in some pocket of North Maharashtra. So that I, like that is unfortunate that you know like uh, his house was hardly uh, one kilometer away from my college, but I didn't know that 
uh, that that person is there. It's in January that I came to know about him. Then in 2005, six, I think there was a series of talks uh, organized, uh, uh, and where I got to hear, listen to uh, Comrade Sharad Patil. So, uh, see, I mean, uh, he has Comrade Sharad Patil. He has uh, been with Communist Party. Then there is a, a kind of uh, he broke with Communist Party, and then he's tried to uh, operate a synthesis which is called Mafua, Marx, Fule, Ambedkar, Wad. Uh, and like today's topic, like struggle against caste and capitalism. So like in this, there are two phenomena, uh, caste and capitalism. Uh, caste, which is of uh, indigenous nature, I mean, so the origin of which uh, is indigenous and capitalism arguably of exogenous in that it has uh, broadly and if not completely uh, uh, external uh, origins or let us call it it has a global uh, dimension it has a universal dimension so the problem that the capitalism uh, uh, entails they they necessarily call for that uh, universal response uh, because the problem is of universal uh, nature and caste system which is proper to our social space so, and I think that's where the characteristic or a particularity of uh, the synthesis that he has tried to put in place. I mean, I'm not, I don't consider myself a competent reader of Comrade Sharad Patil, but because very last, since last uh, five, 10 years, I think I have started reading his work and I got uh, some of, like his work in Marathi is much more difficult than his work in uh, English. But I think uh, people like Professor Umesh Bagade and Professor uh, Dilip Chauhan, they have been engaging with his th thought uh, uh, since many, many years. And I think we got the right person uh, uh, who has uh, been engaging with, uh, with the thought and the philosophical proposition of uh, Comrade Shahid Patil. So, I mean, uh, what we would want to uh, kind of know that, what is his diagnosis of these two issues, these two phenomena? that we have in today's uh, uh, topic. Uh, what is his, the, the particularity of his topic and how does he situate himself uh, in the tradition of, let's say, uh, communism in India and then uh, the uh, uh, Ambedkar, Ambedkarism in India? And what is the nature of his philosophical proposition? Then? So I think more or less uh, on those lines, we would like to hear, listen to uh, Professor Umesh Bagade and I will not uh, take much time. And I would request Professor Bagade to uh, start his intervention. Professor Sharad Baniskar, the chairman of this session and friends. I thank uh, DSF for inviting me to speak on Professor Sharad Baniskar. Uh, Sharad Baniskar has explained you the kind of legendary presence of Ashrat Patil in the movement and academic circle of Maharashtra. Obviously, you know that uh, in his early days, when he was 17, 18, he joined the Communist Party. He was studying uh, uh, at the Vedo uh, School of Art at Mumbai. He had a certain kind of keen interest in studies of art, but was uh, participating in student agitation and then joined the Communist Party of India. And since then, he became full-timer of the Communist Party of India. This man, who is giving us philosophy, was an activist, primarily activist, and trained himself in history, trained himself in Indology, trained himself in history, literature in Pali, trained himself in anthropology, had a certain kind of interaction with Marxist kind of lineage of thought, as well as a certain kind of lineage of Satyashodak Ambedkar uh, kind of thought. So interestingly, you have to understand that uh, his father was a Satyashodak. So there was a Satyashodak lineage, which was there with him when he himself was somehow taking education. Then you, you have to understand that he was a whole timer and he had uh, uh, worked in the uh, Adivasi, this tribal belt of uh, Khandesh, 
from where uh, Sharad Bhaviskar comes. This tribal belt, he fought for the land issues of tribals. So he was, he laid the tribal uh, agitation. And since uh, 1956 onward, he is working within the tribals of Maharashtra. And as a part of his struggle, he engaged with Marxism. Uh, you, you might be knowing that he, when he was in uh, prison, he, he found out the mistake made by Karl Marx in his equation, in his mathematics. And he pointed out that particular mistake to the uh, then Secretary of Communist Party, Bitya Randiwe. And he acknowledged that the, the mistake which you have pointed out is, is right. So in that sense, he was engaging critically with Marxism. And his engagement with Marxism has changed him to a certain kind of uh, thinker who was asking Communist Party of India to take up the caste, anti-caste uh, democratic revolution as the proposition to fight in India. So certainly you have to understand from 1972 onwards, he was struggling within the party that the party should take up the issue of caste. And hence you will find there was a certain kind of engagement with Ulamberkirism and Marxism. It was a certain kind of uh, exercise and endeavor which was indigenization of Marxism. How one can understand Marxism, not only in universal terms, but in concrete terms of contradictions in India. The anti caste democratic revolution, what way the Marxism can help this certain kind of, we can say, uh, agenda of anti caste revolution. So, in that line, he started thinking, and certainly in uh, 1978, he uh, broke from Communist Party of India and uh, started a party which is called Communist Party, so the Shuddha Communist Party. And then his, you can say, struggle to uh, fight against caste, particularly to evolve a history, to explain the history of India, to somehow to explain the certain kind of precarious conditions of Indian situation, caste, capitalism, other categories of gender and other things. So his academic exercises started from 1971 onwards. So you find that there is prolific writing we have, even in English as well as Marathi. Sarath Patil has written in EPW, Sarath Patil has written in Social Scientist, Sarath Patil has written in Mainstream. All these kinds of journals were uh, journals uh, offering English language. And there are several kinds of journals in Marathi. Himself has started Satyashodak Marswari. Then there were certain kind of other journals like Satyashodak uh, 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 journal, which he himself started. Then there was Navharat, there was other journals, and he wrote in various journals of Maharashtra and has enormous kinds of books, for example, Dashuddha Siddhi, and there are parts or four kind of volumes of Dashuddha Siddhi. So uh, the kind of uh, stupendous kind of work he has offered in kind of way. So let us begin what exactly uh, uh, way he was giving us a certain kind of uh, philosophical uh, premises. One thing that uh, what way he engaged with Marxism, he found that Marxism has been understood with the certain kind of uh, structure within which the Marxism was molded, where class becomes the only universal category through which the whole world is understood. So it is the only one category which was used to understand the contradictions of the uh, different parts of the world. Comrade Sharad Party objected this uh, particular kind of, we can say, uh, emphasis on class. He said this is a unilinear uh, historical materialism. So this is not exactly the reality in the world, neither this reality in Maharashtra or India. This reality is different. And what is this reality? This reality is largely caste reality. So he objected bilinear class-based kind of contradiction and somehow reacted or 
we can say put forth the multilinear historical materialism. The multilinear historical materialism argues that not only class is the only uh, system of exploitation and domination. There are several other systems of exploitation and domination. So he gives an so example of uh, uh, the uh, slavery, where the race becomes a kind of institution which is exploitative as well as uh, administration. Then even in the South Africa or Africa, there is tribe and tribe in operates as institution of exploitation and domination. In India, in in the past, it was a varna which was operated as a system of exploitation and domination, and in modern times, it was system of uh, cast as a system of exploitation and domination. And particularly after colonialism, you will find there is a system of caste class exploitation, caste gender, and kind of you can say uh, ca caste exploitation. So these kinds of three institutions combined together are a certain kind of grounding to exploitation and domination in India. So largely, he was putting forth a certain kind of principle which is understood as multilinear historical materialism. One. The second kind of, we can say, principle which he offers is a certain kind of epistemic breakthrough. This is quite complex, but it is a certain kind of emphasis which he always has given that his method particularly is a Brahmi method. And this is a certain kind of positive Brahmi method, which he is giving us to understand the history and reality of India. And what exactly he was arguing for? He said that there was a certain kind of emphasis in Marxism that truth is articulated as a reflective reality. Uh, what is this? For example, the, the truth is there uh, 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 and we, we, we can uh, understand it, we can know it through our senses. So a certain kind of, we can say, a reality which is reflected and articulated uh, by, the, by our senses. And that is a certain kind of uh, understanding which is being explained as or termed as the Pratibhimbavadi understanding. And he said that the reflection, reflection is, is not in terms of other, reflection, reflection of the reality. The, the, uh, so it is understood as that uh, the reflection of reality in the mind is knowledge. In that sense, uh, a certain kind of, you can say, understanding is developed in Marxism. Uh, he says that uh, in Buddhist tradition, there were great thinkers like uh, Dignaga and Dharmakirti who talked about the two kinds of, we can say, ways of understanding, and so two kinds of things, where uh, the Nirvikalpa and Sarvikalpa. Nirvikalpa is the kind of understanding which is a certain kind of uh, way, a reflection of reality. And the other is Sarvikalpa, uh, is in certain way where the conceptions are driving the understanding. So the, this, this whole kinds of, you can say, ideas which you might be engaging with, uh, you might be engaging with Parasul, you might be engaging with Fried, you might be engaging with Sarth and so many uh, thinkers who were taking a certain kind of uh, conception of uh, the cervical. That is cervical, it, it, it's a certain kind of subconscious. Subconscious is, you can say, deal. And he said that this, this particular kind of Dharmakirti and uh, uh, Dignagar's kind of philosophical uh, exposition, which talks about the understanding, which is higher, more kind of higher understanding, where, you, where the reality could be understood through. Uh, it is conscious and subconscious epistemology. He talks it as the conscious subconscious epistemology. And then he says that this is a Brahmi basically because this is developed by the, the Buddhism, particularly the late Yuha Buddhism, where uh, the understanding was developed because it was fighting against 
the uh, the Brahminical school of thought. So he explains that what is uh, Buddhism was a philosophy of realism. He explains it is a Bhayartavad. Then he says that there was a certain kind of Bhayartavad which was uh, developed by Brahminism, which, which was called as Nai Vaisheshikvad. And this Nai Vaisheshikvad had a certain kind of debate where this particular caste was defended through the materialist kind of categories, Bhayartavad. So, therefore, to oppose caste, to reject caste, to destroy caste, the Buddhism has developed the particular kind of epistemology. The subconscious, subconscious epistemology was developed by the uh, Buddhist school. And he says that this particular kind of, you can say, epistemology is part of his philosophical endeavor. This is the second part. And third kind of the aspect which he was developing at that time was explaining history of uh, India, explaining the cultural and uh, traditions of India, explaining the philosophy of India, explaining the particular kind of political economy of India in the terms of Brahmi, a Brahmi conceptual categories. So he defined uh, a kind of uh, a Brahmi as not exactly as caste, but it is a certain kind of category where three kinds of, we can say, uh, indicators could be seen. First, whatever which we can say allegiance to Vedas is it, it, Brahmi. Those, those who takes up the lineage from the patriarchal Aryans are Brahmi. Those who support caste and women equality are Brahmi. And there is, we can say, another tradition, which is, we can say, termed as a Brahmi, which takes the lineage from the pre-Aryan matri matriarchal societies, pre-Aryan gynocracies. From there, the legacy comes from. The second thing he argues that the second part is that it is against the lineage of Vedas. It reject, rejects the Vedas allegiance. And third, it is against the uh, caste qualities and against the gender equality. There are two kinds of broad concepts within which he unfolds the several kinds of concepts. Sir, sir, uh, ek second. Tumi camera banda karal ka tumcha. Manje ma awaz jasta clear hi. Karan awaz sa sa clear hai. Then headphone asil the headphone dhalun bola na sir. Okay. Yes, sir, there was uh, there was some problem with the audio. So okay, I will I will speak loudly. Uh, so it will be uh, uh, easier. Sagre camera off Karamaja Mate, Azum Kai don't think camera on this side. Switch off the cameras, all of you. So you have a camera. It might improve the quality. Okay. 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 Within a, a kind of framework which we can understand as the framework of Brahmi Abrahmi concepts. This conceptual frame of Brahmi Abrahmi explains the contradictions, and therefore, he was giving us certain kind of indicators of Brahmi, uh, term Brahmi, and he gives indicators of the term Abrahmi. So, in India, there was a certain kind of, we can say, contradiction which is explained through the, you can say, uh, these kind of two terms. It is not a binary in certain sense because in each and every phase of history, each and every you can say stage of contradictions, the the conception of Brahmi and conception of Brahmi would be different. But these are the markers, Brahmi as a marker and a Brahmi as a marker could explain us what is the uh, reality. And to know the reality, we should use the terms or concepts like Brahmi or Brahmi. So, in certain way, he was giving us a certain kind of, we can say, conceptual tools. He was giving us uh, epistemology of conscious, subconscious, and he was giving us a certain kind of philosophy, which he says as multilineal historical materialism. So, what was he doing? He was he was correcting Marxism. He was, in certain way, was uh, somehow uh, attacking on the 
infallibility of uh, uh, Marxism. Marxism always had a certain kind of claim that it is the last philosophy. It is a kind of scientific philosophy. And therefore, sometime, I can say it, it happened, particularly because of the Marxist lineage in India, it becomes a certain kind of sacred kind of book where uh, uh, whatever Marx has said is right. There is no way that Marx could be wrong. So here, uh, Comrade Sharad Patil offered a criticism of Marxism. And that is, a, we can say, a kind of a, a way he engaged with uh, Marxism. He was Marxist. However, he criticized Marxist, Marxism. He brought out several limitation of Marxism and he wanted to correct it. So what way there, there can be a certain kind of, we can say, way ahead. So he was resolving, a, we can say, way out. And therefore, he was, we can say, helpful to us to understand not only the politics of Marxism, but to understand uh, the grounding of Marxism is largely history. The theories are built around history. So he was reworking the history of India. There's a fabulous kinds of insight he was he's giving to us about in, in Indian past, particularly ancient past. He was explaining that in ancient past, there was matriarchy and gynocracy prevailed. So there was a conception of Marxism about the primitive communism. So he attacks on this conception of primitive communism. And particularly, uh, he takes a certain kind of, we can say, that his uh, epistemology, so conscious subconscious epistemology, where he says that the meanings are not eternal. Meaning can be changed accordingly. So as the time moves, the meanings changed. So word doesn't have eternal meanings. Words are not eternal. So he gives example of the word niruti. And then through a certain kind of etymological exercise, he had a can say, long kind of debate and battle in this Indology, particularly Sanskrit tradition, where he says there are two ways of understanding uh, Vedas. One way of understanding Veda is Brahmi. And there was another way of understanding Veda is a Brahmi. And there was a Brahmi thinker called Shaktaina. And Shaktaina gives us a certain kind of modality to understand Vedas. So taking the whole kind of, we can say, legacy of Shaktaina, he explains that there is a certain kind of verses in Atharveda. And in this Atharveda, there is a mention of a Niruti who claims that she is a Rashtri. And in she, she is, you can say, sitting or you can say is sitting there or ha can say, having uh, there. The whole kind of like, verses was interpreted, understood as the as the proof of matriarchy in the ancient past. Uh, so Sharad Patil was deploying at the particular kind of insights of anthropology. Uh, he was engaging with uh, uh, Engels. The, his book of the Holy Family then takes out several kinds of can say, archaeological evidences, takes out certain kind of can say, anthropological evidences, and concludes that there was a certain kind of uh, uh, a system of gynocracy and uh, uh, matriarchy prevailed in ancient past. So certainly he was explaining the certain kind of evolution of Indian history. I won't go into detail, but it's very interesting kinds of insight he was giving. Uh, why there was, uh, we can say, Buddhist revolt, or why there was Buddhist revolution, and what was the reasons about it was was cited. But what was the nature of Buddhist revolution was never explained. Comrade Sharad Party explains that this this revolution was the revolution uh, ending the Varna system, ending the slave slavery, Dasha Shudra slavery. So the, this particular kind of revolution which Buddha brought has demolished, uh, annulled the uh, Dasa system and annulled the Varna hierarchy. So it was a certain way has given a, a certain kind of, you can say, birth to new kinds of, you can say, mode of production. And that new mode of production later on developed into caste system. 
So this was his kind of, we can say, understanding where he, uh, we can say, quotes Didi uh, Kosumbi, uh, he takes reference is from Vidi Chattopadhyay. He is referring to certain kinds of kind of anthropologists as well as historians. He refers uh, Romila Thapar. He has kind of great debate with Romila Thapar and others. I won't go into details of this, but it is a quite a great kind of way we should engage with his uh, understanding of history. I will certainly come to a certain kind of later phase because our uh, uh, main theme is about capitalism and caste. And therefore, one has to understand that uh, what way he was engaging with a certain category of caste and class. One has to understand that Sharad Patil, uh, in certain way, was uh, explaining us the linkages between caste and class. His proposition was this, that prior to British rule, prior to British rule, there was no system of class prevailed in India. This is a quite a concrete and very, uh, uh, if you can say, uh, important kind of observation he's making about. You won't find any reference of class in pre-British rule. What exactly the Marxist historians have done? Marxist historians have argued that Marx has explained that whenever there is surplus appropriation, this, then their class exists. Marx has a certain kind of theoretical proposition that whenever there is a certain kind of surplus appropriation, class exists. Similarly, the Marxist scholars and historians presumed a class where there was no class. That was empathically explained by Comrade Sharad Patil. And he argues that there was no class existed prior to British rule. Uh, uh, late uh, Gail Omwit has a, diff her, a different kind of understanding of class and caste. What she was talking about, she was talking about in pre-British period, class was inherited in caste. What she was saying, in pre-British period, class was inherited in uh, class was inherited in caste. It was not manifesting; it was hidden within the structure of caste. But when British came, class became manifested. Class was had a manifestation in uh, British period. And here she said it was identical, means uh, the, the, uh, the lower classes were those who were low castes. So they, they were having certain kind of, we can say, uh, 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 co-joint existence, means lower classes were low caste. But in British period, in British period, uh, the uh, class and caste separated. And there was a certain kind of elite who, who emerged within the lower caste, as well as the higher caste also had a certain kind of amount of downtrodden. So this is a certain kind of understanding which uh, Gil Omwet has given. Comrade Sharath Party argues with uh, Gil and says that no, there was no existence of class prior to British period. Secondly, she, he has that uh, the, the, this, this, this whole kind of class emerged in times of British period, but this particular emergence of class has to be seen with the existence of caste. He said that class configured around caste. The, for example, if you take the, the, uh, the, the classes which we bourgeois, the bourgeois emerged from I caste, particularly the trader caste. So the trading communities uh, becomes the capitalist classes in India. So he, he explains that in India, there was a coexistence of caste and class. The caste in certain way impacted uh, class and class impacted caste. So this was a certain kind of process where the caste and class became a certain kind of uh, uh, intertwined reality. So this is interesting kind of we can say observation which he uh, gives us. Third important thing which he talks that in 
we can say later phase, particularly in British period as well as, as in uh, after independence, there was emergence of classes within castes, and these classes within caste has we can say changed the whole kind of political economy of India. Interestingly, he uses a certain kind of you can say theoretical tool, which is given by. Uh, Jain Lele. Jain Lele has written a certain kind of you can say, uh, 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 can say a book about uh, 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 elite uh, and plural rule in India, where the uh, the high caste and the low caste, particularly the the elites in, within the low caste, together uh, has formed the ruling class. So this is a certain kind of understanding which Jayatrele has given to us. Uh, Comrade Sharath Patil takes out the uh, understanding of uh, Jayatrele and deploys it to the kind of political economy of uh, uh, India and to explain that how the, uh, you can say, ruling classes were composed of. So interestingly, one important aspect which he is talking about is to explain the linkages between class and caste. The second aspect, which is very important, and that is what exactly uh, the forty of Kabir Sharad Party, or what was the major contribution of Sharad Party, is this: the Sharad Party argued that the caste is not not the part of sub superstructure. Caste is part of structure. There is a certain kind of, we can say, model which is offered by Marxism, where uh, caste is seen as part of superstructure. It is seen as uh, part of culture. It's seen as the part of, we can say, uh, uh, consciousness, uh, uh, cultural consciousness or uh, ideological consciousness, but doesn't seen as the material reality. Pombrel Sharad Patil strongly argued that how caste operate as mode of production and caste operate uh, in certain way as a, a mode of relationship. So caste as mode of uh, production, caste as mode of exchange is explained by Sharad Patil. And his more important contribution is about that how caste as a economic system, caste as a material system operates in India. He gives enormous kinds of, we can, we can say, probes to establish that how caste operated as a system of material exploitation. So certainly one has to understand that uh, these kinds of, we can say, theoretical where uh, the class is seen as, as the only kind of uh, self, where uh, the Marxism, uh, can say, understand the contradictions and you might be knowing there was an article written by Mao and Mao uh, article is being uh, uh, quoted by Comrade Sharad Patil. Uh, there was a certain understanding in Marxism, Baso Punya has written on uh, these contradictions and it is said that only, only the class contradiction is uh, a way of understanding the Marxism. There are two kinds of contradiction is been uh, explained. One is antagonistic contradiction, and the other is non-antagonistic contradiction. And Kapoorneya argues that uh, only class contradiction are antagonistic, and therefore they are secular, and therefore Marxism should go for class contradiction only. Comrade Sharad Patil, by taking Mao argues that, argues that, uh, Mao, what Mao says, Mao says that these contradiction, anti, uh, these antagonistic contradictions and non-antagonistic contradictions are not watertight compartments. They, they enter into each other. And so, therefore, one has to understand that these contradictions, these contradictions uh, can change, we can say, their, their kind of sides. And therefore, one has to understand the complexity of the uh, contradiction in India. Here we'll find that there are several contradictions emerge uh, 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 same time, simultaneously in, in kind of 
Indian so society. You will find there is gender contradiction, there is a class contradiction, and there is a caste contradiction. So all such kinds of, you can say, complex contradictions could, should not be understood only within the kind of, you can say, uh, uh, Marxist parameters where only antagonistic contradictions are class contradictions, other are non-antagonistic. But you have to understand that the caste contradiction in India is antagonistic. It remains antagonistic because the higher caste and lower caste have their own kind of caste uh, interest and material interest within which they fought and within which they, they the whole kind of society changed. So in this kind of uh, premises, one has to understand that Comrade Sharad Patil was, you can say, explaining a, a certain kind of trajectory of the multifaceted kind of contradictions and antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions. So he was explaining us that there is a certain kind of Marxist uh, proposition that workers of the world unite. Comrade Sharath Patil gives example that uh, the working class of uh, England was that working class of England was uh, aligning with the working class of India or that working class in England was in interest of ruling class in England because they were ruling over India. So working class of in England was signing with the, the elites of uh, uh, England to, to subjugate the colonies like India. So this is a certain kind of, we can say, ways one has to understand the contradictions. So contradictions has to be seen not only in theoretical analysis, but as it operates in concrete realities. And these concrete realities has to be understood through a certain kind of flexibility in your kind of thematic structures where you can use the terms like antagonistic contradictions and con we can say, uh, uh, non-antagonistic contradictions. So he has a kind of important uh, explanation about it. The third thing, what, what he was saying, and I explained you about it, is particularly why there for India. It was an important article which he has offered in EPW, it seems to me, that he has said, what should be the basis of reservations, class or caste? So that is important kind of, we can say, uh, argument he has offered in uh, EPW where he was talking about the economic structure of caste and how caste economy operates in India. So interest, you can see important is what the, the ruling class, the bourgeoisie or industrial kind of, uh, we can say capitalist, emerged from the trading communities of India, trading caste of India. And therefore, one has to understand that lower caste, even the lower caste had their own kind of, we can say, caste, if I can say contradictions. For example, uh, Comrade Sharath Patil explains that in India, there were several kinds of peasant agitation took place. And you know that in uh, prior to British, uh, the British period, peasantry fought against two major kinds of, you can say, demands where there. One is to uh, aid the bonded labor. There was a certain kind of weight bigari existing Koti, there was weight bigari all over the world all over the Mar India. So we'll, uh, we'll find that the, the communists also and all kinds of, you can say, peasant decisions were fighting against the boredness. And the second kind of, you can say, struggles were uh, demanding uh, the right for the land. Interestingly, there was, uh, there was a certain kind of rebellion which took place at Telangana. And you will find in Telangana, there was redistribution of land. But you will find that the land distributed to the tribals and untouchables were, were not remained with them. The middle class could hold their own lands, which was dis distributed in Telangana. But the Dalits and uh, the, uh, these uh, tribals could not, we can say, uh, continue the, their hold on that lands. Secondly, when you note that there was uh, act, can say act which put full kaida in, I think in 1958, there was a certain kind of uh, uh, law giving the right to ten tenants to own the land. So you will find that even in that act or in sealing act, the untouchable kind of agricultural laborers, and uh, we can say, were not given right to land. 
So one has to understand that how caste operate as economic system. So this was a certain kind of emphatic argument which Congress Sarath Party was offering. And certainly the way caste and capitalism are intertwined. In India, particularly, his uh, forceful argument is that uh, the the the, culture, the cultural view of Brahminism and the whole kind of economic paradigm of capitalism are united together, and therefore one has to understand that certain kind of class which operates in India had a very co complex kind of can say nature, where, for example, middle classes are in one side. They're Brahminizing themselves, and in second hand, they are Westernizing themselves. So we'll find that these kinds of complex things are working uh, together, capitalism and caste, and uh, particularly patriarchy, the Brahminical patriarchy, are working together and was uh, ruling over us. So this is a certain kind of, we can say, explanation which he is giving. He has two phases in his kind of endeavor. In the earlier part of his uh, thought, he uh, uh, took inspiration from Fuller and uh, uh, in, in each and every means, I have can say not mentioned many kind of important aspects which he is thinking was, but he he has interpreted Fuller and Berker as philosophers. So he brought out. Uh, uh, the basic ideas of Pallian Ambedkar, systematized it and put it in the prism, uh, prism of Marxism. So we'll find that uh, he has interpreted Pallian Ambedkarism under the prism of uh, Pallian Ambedkar, under the prism of Marxism, and he interpreted Marxism in the light of uh, the thought of Pallian Ambedkarism. So in, in, in that sense, he has brought various kinds of, we can say, new dimension to Fuller and Berkerism. He was the first man who explained that why Fuller was uh, a philosopher, because Fuller gives a certain kind of universal principle called uh, the uh, Seshwar Yantrik Bhaktikwa. It is, it is the, uh, 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 the uh, mechanical uh, kind of immaterialism, but which, which uh, uh, give allegiance to God, presence of Nirmi. So he explains uh, the Bhatma uh, Pule, he gives a certain kind of reading to it, to Ambedkar, and in that sense, he uses uh, Pule Ambedkar's kinds of insights to build a philosophy called Mars Pule Ambedkarism. It was in second phase of his uh, endeavor, he uh, claims that Pule Ambedkar was not philosopher and uh, uh, argues that he has now developed a new philosophy called Soundrantic Marxism. And then he argues about it, that what exactly it gives us. His emphasis is that uh, this unconscious, if you are to an annul caste, if you are to annihilate caste, you have to, you have to annihilate it not from the conscious, but you have to annihilate it from subconscious. So his proposition is that anti-caste democratic revolution should be based on Santrantic Marxism. So his we can say argument and his claim is this that now he has developed this philosophy called uh, Santrantic Marxism, and uh, through that Santrantic Marxism, uh, you you can lead uh, uh, the uh, struggle uh, uh, bringing out anti-caste democratic revolution. Lastly, I will somehow cite two, three things about his philosophy. You can say one aspect of philosophy, and I will end. I know that I have already passed my time, and that is a Brahmi aesthetics. He talks about a Brahmi aesthetics. He has referred to Dharma Kirti. Uh, he, you can say, has analyzed different kind of literary kind of, you can say, expression in Mah Maharashtra, and particularly his article on Dharma Kirti, his article in uh, Zati Yostak Samanti Sevakatwa, caste feudal servitude. You will find that uh, he explains what is his understanding of Brahmi Samdarya Shastra, uh, where uh, particularly the Saundarya has to be understood, the aesthetics has to be understood, not in the terms of Marxism. Marxism, particularly Nambudripa, says that uh, the high, ca high classes. 
uh, has having a leisure has created culture. Kamrashwath Patil can say attacks on Nandudri Pad and says that this is not true, that uh, the, the toiling lower classes, the toiling lower caste has created the culture, created, created the literature. And he explains his kinds of theoretical premises by taking out cervical and nirvical kind of, you can, can say, uh, categories of the uh, Naga. Uh, Vasabandhu's category, Chitta Samprayukta, Chitta Vipruyukta, all this category he takes out and uh, he establishes a kind of grounding as a Brahmin Sambha Shastra. Uh, in uh, uh, Marxism, there is uh, a kind of debate where the aesthetic is class divided, reason you fight. And later on, people say it's class div divided. And Congress Sharad Party later on takes it to caste and how a certain way uh, one can approach to an uh, alternative to aesthetics. And until you are not offering and can say aesthetics, which can annihilate the, the, the kind of uh, sanskaras of caste on subconscious, you cannot, uh, we can say, annihilate caste. So he has his own kind of, we can say, philosophical endeavor, where you will find you can disagree with him, you can have dispute with him, but he has enormous kinds of insight uh, as, as a student of history, as a student of political science, as a student of, you can say, anthropology, a student of literature, or any kind of, you can say, field of knowledge. And mostly for those who are fighting uh, in field, particularly against caste, against class, against, against the patriarchy, would get something from him, if at all they take uh, his ideas. And the majority of his writings are English. So there is no in that way uh, that I, uh, as 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 a uh, expert of Russian party, should always speak in behalf for for you. You yourself can uh, read his kind of can say articles and books. EPW the store is kind of a place where you can find his articles. And in earlier period, uh, he was very prolific. So you can find social scientists mainstream where you can find his ideas and his books are published by Maulai. So I stop here and I thank you all for patiently listening to me uh, for more than uh, uh, 50 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, sir, for uh, giving us a broad uh, canvas of uh, Comrade Sharad Patil's thought. Uh, we are very glad that like you uh, spoke for such uh, extensively and like uh, in January, we used to have this post dinner talks, which used to go until 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And there used to be a lot of question answer and session. Uh, but of course, this online medium has some limitations. So like we have to do this thing. Uh, so without much uh, delay, I will be handing over to Professor Sharad Baviskar, sir, for his uh, chair's remarks, concluding remarks. And then we'll have a short Q&A session. Over to you, sir. Sharad, sir. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really uh, insightful uh, intervention, in, insightful talk, despite the technical, technological this uh, constraints. And I know that Professor Bagade hates to, uh, you know, speak, use this uh, uh, this medium. Uh, he would have loved to come to JNU and actually it would have been much more interesting. And we would uh, actually do that in the uh, normal times. Uh, see. Uh, to come back to this, uh, the topic is that uh, Congress Sharad Party, I mean, there is no, there is a lot of inconsistency and inconsist inconsistency, inconsistency, not in its a negative sense of the term, but you see at different stages, uh, different take or different propositions that uh, we get from a Congress Sharad Party. For example, when he is there within the uh, fold of uh, uh, Indian Com uh, Communist Party, then we see what he's struggling with and then he comes out of it. Uh, and what I, when I read Comrade Sharad Patil, what I understand as his uh, strength or forte is that uh, more than a historian, he's a philologist, like, you know, trained in Sanskrit. I mean, philology is the way, philosophy of language, the way he looks at Indian history, because his proposition, philosophical proposition and strategies to uh, to uh, execute in some manner that uh, proposition uh, into his action uh, for that proposition and for those strategies, his understanding of 
history or his philosophy of history serves as a cornerstone of his enormous uh, literature uh, and i think uh, with this wow. after this lecture uh, am i audible yes sir yes you are audible you are audible all right all right uh, so this his understanding of uh, indian history or his philosophy of history with which he understands uh, indian history because what there is a negative component to his literature and positive component to his literature and the political as a side of uh, let us say as a side of uh, pragmatism okay because the political is neither the negative let first of all let me clarify the the meaning of the word negative because some of our uh, friends may take it as a kind of you know in its a very usual sense of the term negative does not mean in uh, technical language as something uh, bad negative here it's a synonym for scientific synonym for uh, something that you know that for every philosopher there is a critical take and which is also called negative take negative doesn't mean the way we understand in our day to day language oh this is bad about sharad patil or this is bad about anybody else one has to first understand how the words are deployed in our research so when i say negative comp component to sharad patil means that his critical understanding of what how the uh, material conditions uh, have been constituted in the course of history and that critical take is considered qualified defined as a negative component so if there is any sharad patil uh, follower should not start trolling me that i'm using that sharad patil has negative that that is not my business so and there is a positive component which i think if we read his uh, i think second chapter of his mafua we understand that uh, he makes it very clear that a philosopher is not someone who would uh, uh, who would uh try to impose uh, a synthesis because this marx fully ambedkar was this synthesis is not something that is coming from the above but he says that there was the demand from the from the field you know and this demand of course uh, uh, marxist were led to join that demand but in the 70s he is giving the example of uh, rao sarkar's bay or uh, even uh, on the gel on the all this and then that is where actually he steps in and then the the the, the synthesis that he is trying to work out uh, so i mean i have no issues with him when it comes to his understanding of uh, uh, indian history or his philosophy of history i have no issues the way he articulates uh, his synthesis where he considers the uh, philosophical proposition of mahatma phule and baba saheb ambedkar something very central and uh, Uh, fundamental uh, to uh, uh, to the diagnosis, uh, and, and in this, as uh, Professor uh, Umesh Bagade pointed out rightly, that uh, he makes it very clear even in this book. I think if I can switch on the uh, uh, the camera just briefly, uh, in this book he makes it very clear that you know Fule and Ambedkar are philosophers, but then in the second, in the last uh, phase, uh, he becomes more rhetorical. Actually, that's where I have some issues with him. and as he uh, i had discussion with professor bagade 2 uh, 3 weeks ago when i was in aurangabad when he when commercial party mm, sounds with dogmatic that he is not philosopher or that is not philosopher like something he fought against like he fought, fought against infallibilism dogmatism and we see that towards the end uh, as to put and uh, to quote if uh, professor bagade allows me towards the end he becomes rhetorical and declamatory Uh, so that's where i have issues with him so i think with uh, i i'm not going to have a parallel session here uh, i'm just trying to kind of uh, uh, offer uh, my thoughts um, and i think i would uh, open the session uh, with the permission of the organizers for answer questions and answers uh, is it all right sajid uh, yes sir yes sir yes. uh, you can like put your uh, Uh, if you have any questions, we can put it in the chat box, or if uh, we can also like let someone to like uh, unmute themselves and like give a brief comments. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Inayat Pardesi. Uh, what is socio-political program of Swatantrik Marxism suggested by Comrade Sharad Patil? Uh, like Marx, uh, like uh, suggested by Marxism, fully Ambedkarism has. so like what is the social socio political program of swatantrik marxism suggested by comrade sharad patil like marxism fully ambedkarism has uh, <laughs> if you can see the question in chat box sir there, there, there is a certain kind of we can say a debate 
uh, where Comrade Sir Patil was busy uh, struggling in field as well as struggling in philosophy. So when one has to understand that Sir Patil was largely largely limited within a certain kind of struggle uh, in Khandesh. She was leading a struggle of uh, the landless uh, Adivasis tribals. Uh, one. Secondly, uh, his major kind of engagement in philosophy, history, anthropology, sociology uh, remained in uh, the field of caste. So he was fighting the issues of tribals and was uh, theorizing about uh, the, the, the kind of revolution, Mantikas, democratic revolution. So one has to understand that uh, within this kind of, you can say, uh, 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 two kind of uh, premises, or two kinds of engagement, Omrish Sarath Patil has opened up a certain kind of, you can say, area where everybody should engage them. And when he was talking about Mafua, uh, he was giving a certain kind of, you can say, project of anti democratic revolution. And even when he was uh, propounding uh, Sultan Smart's work, there also was his kind of emphasis on anti-cultural democratic revolution. So Mapua and uh, Santratik Smart's doesn't have two different kinds of programs. They were one and the same. Uh, in earlier part as well as second part. Then two, uh, there was a certain kind of development of ideas. For example, in early part, you don't find that uh, he has developed this particular kind of uh, idea of land rights. So he's talking about land rights. It was core to Marxist philosophy that there should be land distribution. So he was uh, somehow reiterating about land distribution. But however, in last kind of cancer phase, particularly when he was on his own in Marsward, he made certain kind of, you can say, programmatic uh, positions about how one can uh, redistribute land by having uh, anti-caste agenda. So he was uh, blending two kinds of positions within this program of land dist distribution. One is of anti-caste uh, uh, revolution or anti-caste uh, premises of redistribution of uh, land. So this is one has to understand that uh, one way one can understand that when he was talking about Mapua, there was a certain kind of commonality in ideas. For example, he in uh, the Ashudra slavery uh, part uh, two, where he was giving us a certain kind of what is philosophy, what is epistemology, epistemology where he uh, quotes uh, Dharmakirti and uh, Dignaga and uh, exposes about the uh, uh, the Abramni epistemology or a subconscious conscious based uh, the epistemology. And similar epistemology is later on explained. And the, there is a certain kind of growth in his understanding, particularly the way he understood Dignaga was developed in later phase, particularly when he was writing uh, the uh, caste plural servitude. And later on, when he was writing the fourth of Hindu, there was a certain kind of growth of his idea. Uh, where you will find that he was talking about aesthetics in uh, kind of can say, more kind of uh, developed way. So there is a certain kind of aspect which grows with Southern Sikh Marxism. Uh, the, the, my emphasis would be this that uh, there should not be made, there should not be a certain kind of differences between these two programs as there was only one program, uh, his understanding of Marxism was that, that uh, particularly in Russia, Russia, Russian communists have uh, uh, not taken out the anti the, the democratic revolution. And because uh, Russia has rejected democratic revolution as a phase between socialist revolution, that is the error which is made by Marxism. And therefore, one has to uh, correct this by uh, going for this anti cultural democratic revolution. That stance remains the same. So in that sense, uh, the programmatic uh, theoretical premises may have changed. Detailing uh, changed, 
and uh, many people asked that there should be more retailing. So this is a certain kind of endeavor. These disciples and uh, those who are the activists of commercial party should take over and should establish the details of that program. Yes, sir. So we now have a question from Sarika. She's asking, Marx in Gundrize and other writings on India counters the notion of caste being superstructural in nature. Uh, why do you think Indian Marxists and intellectuals have defended this belief for such a long time? <laughs> uh, one thing one has to understand is that uh, Marx doesn't have a concrete kind of uh, picture of reality. Uh, Marx has developed his idea particularly about Asian uh, mode of production and basically based on the ideas given by the colonial scholars. Uh, his theorization has serious problems. Didi Kosambi uh, had observed about, can say, made some observation about it. Ramila Thapar has made some observation about it. Many scholars of uh, India has made observations about it. Amrishwara's party also rejects his uh, conception of uh, Asiatic mode of production. One. The second thing one has to understand that uh, uh, this is a certain kind of, we can say, theory which was, which was interpreted. And one has to understand that how the ideas are interpreted. We have a different situation. We have different history. We have different kind of, we can say, political economy and different contradictions. So how we are reading to Marxism? There, there is a certain kind of, we can say, Leninist idea that uh, the principal contradiction is a colonial contradiction. And so uh, one should fight against the uh, colonial government. And therefore, the communist joined with the uh, National Congress. So one has to understand this this whole kind of you can say nation as idea sprang from the uh, the kind of uh, Brahminical history and uh, the Vedantic self the Vedantic kind of lineage becomes central to the understanding or conception of uh, India and that was exposed by Tilak that was exposed by the earlier kind of you can say people and because uh, the, this is seen as the contradictions like colonialism it was it was sublimated it was celebrated it was somehow valorized and because it was valorized you will find that uh, those who are fighting against caste is seen as uh, as class is the principal contradiction then the caste is uh, the, the the kind of factor of divide so those who are fighting against against, for the, against, against caste are, are seen as those who are creating caste. Those who are somehow, you can say, for Ambedkar who was, can say, spoke in front of the Manmad railway workers, is seen as was, was the break in unity of uh, working class. One has to understand that there was a certain kind of positioning within which the uh, the earlier kind of communists, particularly which came from uh, largely from the elite background, the Brahmins and other castes. But those who came from Brahmin, they have they don't have the kind of concrete understanding of India reality. They largely brought these ideas into it, and such a way it, it, it was interpreted. You will you you will see. Uh, that in uh, Dange's booklet, where Dange is comparing uh, Tilak with Lenin, and uh, had a certain kind of, we can say, uh, uh, misconception about uh, Mahatma Phule. Mahatma Phule pretty strong, but no communist has ever understood what, what was Mahatma Phule. Later on in 70s, 1970s, towards uh, Vaidya, Prabhakar Vaidya has written on Pule. In later part of, you can say, some kind of, you can say, Marxist started understanding this. But in earlier part, it was always interpreted that uh, this is a superstructure, and as there will, should, there will be a class revolution, caste will vanish. The caste would be automatically vanished when there will be class revolution. So that was 
a certain kind of emphasis which Marx is always taken. You will amiss to know that even the untouchable T was not fought by the Marxists. Even there was no no uh, any <laughs> no struggle which put forth by the communist uh, in colonial kind of times or anything freedom struggle. They they were against uh, caste. They themselves were some of them were we can say not following untouchable. However, they were not having any programmatic agenda fighting untouchable. That was the limitation which Marxism had at that time. It was later, in particularly 1770s, when there was a certain kind of presence of the Dalit Center and People Actions Party, uh, uh, then uh, Gail Ombud, then things started changing place. But till then, there was a certain kind of, you will, you will amazed to know that Sudhir Bedekar, who was not a compromised Marxist, who started the Magova agitation, and there was a journal called Tatparya, at that time was arguing profoundly denying Pule Ambedkar as philosopher. As um, uh, Shirad Baliskar was rightly telling that it was dogmatic. It was it was rhetorical. Uh, he was saying that uh, philosophy is always universal. Shankaracharya was philosopher, but Pule Ambedkar was not philosopher. This is this was the argument which they were offering and this is a similar argument we will we'll find reiterated in several kinds of, you can say, documents of writings of uh, the masses. Basically, because they have their own kind of misinterpretation, and that misinterpretation is basically because they have not concretely, concretely uh, 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 engaged with the contradiction of India. Indian contradictions, particularly when Pule has understood and proclaimed that Indian uh, contradiction is caste contradiction. The Pule Ambedkar has emphasized contradictions, but that was never understood by the uh, Marxist. Secondly, one has to understand that Ambedkar was, you can say, uh, it was taking out not only caste struggle, but was taking class struggle. He was he was wholly in favor of class struggle. They, they, uh, he has they, you can he has we can say brought up uh, uh, independent labor party. His whole agenda was against uh, the capitalist. He declared that he was fighting against classic capitalism and caste. So this, this, there was a certain kind of, we can say, uh, the potential of Ambedkar's kind of struggle. But in 1948, there was a, a, a kind of comment put by Politburo that uh, these uh, untouchables are auxiliary forces of uh, revolution. And uh, Baba Ambedkar is misleading them. So this was this was done in 1948, basically in the light of Telangana, because in Telangana there were the largely the Dalit cadres who were uh, active and vanguard in uh, the Telangana rebellion, and therefore they thought that they might we can say uh, uh, later on because of certain kind of issues of caste will join. Uh, Ambedkar. So they started fighting against Ambedkar. And you will find that this, this is uh, basically because it's particularly class character of uh, um, uh, Marxist thinkers and Marxist, uh, Marxist activists and the kind of dominance which was perpetrated since the beginning of the Communist Party. Uh, uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> We have a couple of questions. Uh, I will just com combine two questions. Uh, one is from Sagar Naik. Uh, he is asking, can you shed some light on the critic of Comrade Sharad Patil by Professor Pradeep Gokhale? Uh, and the second question is from Anga. She is asking, uh, can you explain Comrade Sharad Patil's concept of caste ending bourgeois democratic revolution? Uh, uh, what, what was the first question? Uh, the uh, uh, critic offered by Professor Pradeep Gokhale. Uh, Comrade Sharad Patil's critic of, uh, offered by Pradeep Gokhale, Professor Pradeep Gokhale. <laughs> no, there are two phases of it. Um, the, interestingly, one has to see that uh, there was a certain kind of debate which was there in uh, Maharashtra as well as it was not exactly in Maharashtra only. Uh, Comrade Shirat Patil fought against Dipendra Gupta, Comrade Shirat Patil fought against uh, uh, Nambudri Pad. 
and several other kind of thinker of Marxist of uh, India. And he also had certain kind of arguments in Maharashtra. And uh, one of uh, the arguments was with Mahindale, who was a Sanskritist. And uh, as uh, uh, Professor Sharad Bhavaskar was talking about that he was philologist, was largely with Mahindale. Mahindale and Kamrishal Patil had certain kind of debate about philology in uh, Vedic kind of recognition. Then you will find there was fight between, or the debate between Gilombet and Commercial Patil. And then interestingly, there is debate between uh, uh, Pradeep Gokhale and uh, Commercial Patil. Pradeep Gokhale uh, particularly has two kinds of can say, contentions. One contention, uh, particularly about Sankrantic Marxism. And uh, uh, it, this is his proposition, uh, Pradeep Gokhale's position that this Vijnanavada, that this, this, this uh, uh, cervical kind of understanding and menu, premising many as the, the grounding, uh, his proposition is that uh, the uh, Ambedkar's philosophy uh, is uh, particularly grounding on the uh, empiricism is um, is better than or more kind of acceptable than of this this particular kind of Sankrantik Vijnanvada. So this is one kind of contention where both have different kind of understanding. Uh, Gokhale preferred uh, Ambrika's understanding as impersistent understanding and uh, was not in favor of uh, Sankrantik Marxism, particularly where the subconscious is seen as category. So this is one kind of contention where the, was, uh, the, the debate uh, took over. The second kind of debate is about whether Ambedkar was philosopher or not, where Comrade Sharad Party interface was happened in the interface, uh, where Comrade Sharad Party started talking about was, uh, Ambedkar was a philosopher. Uh, this kind of debate has its own kind of limitation because Comrade Sharad Party Held himself, uh, Comrade Sharad Patil has uh, raised different kind of we can say, categories or criteria on which Ulay Ambedkar should be claimed as philosophers. I won't go into this, but that was a certain kind of exercise where he said that uh, when a Bhashyakar, those who read interpret, through interpretation, if you are creating new kind of ideas, then you are philosopher. That is what exactly we uh, the uh, analysis which uh, Sharad Patil brought up, and earlier uh, time he uh, established Ambedkar as philosopher. Uh, Sharad uh, Pradeep Gokhale has uh, claimed that there is uh, the criteria in Indian tradition, and uh, Ambedkar fulfills all the criteria in Indian tradition. Then he takes out the uh, criteria of uh, Western tradition, and uh, then he argues that through also Western uh, kind of criteria, Ambedkar is philosopher. Comrade Shrat Patil later on argued that uh, the philosophers are only philosophers when they offer ep the epistemology. So whether Ambedkar was offering epistemology. So he said that yes, Ambedkar had a uh, can say ontological position, Ambedkar has a epistemological position. So in that sense, this this particular debate which took place in the last end of his career. Earlier, uh, uh, Pradeep Gokhale was a very quite, quite, I can say good admirer of, <laughs> remained and still a good admirer of Sharad Patil, although he has disputed with uh, Comrade Sharad Patil. What was second question? Uh, yes, sir. So the second question was, uh, can you explain Comrade Sharad Patil's concept of caste ending bourgeois democratic revolution? <laughs> so this is this is what exactly he he picked up from Ambedkar. Means there is a theoretical proposition which was there in Marxism that uh, Marx has conceived that uh, there is two phases of revolution. One is a democratic revolution, and second is that uh, the socialist revolution. So until there is no democratic revolution, there will not be socialist revolution. Marx was uh, somehow theorizing as the 
uh, scientific uh, philosophy. So he was saying there were stages of history. And accordingly, the stage in the revolution, the first stage of revolution is the magnetic revolution. So, uh, uh, Comrade Shrut Patil picked this idea of democratic revolution and uh, his whole kind of content where he explained what is anti democratic revolution is certainly uh, borrowed, mostly from borrowed from polyamericanism. And here is anti caste democratic. So, for example, anti-caste democratic revolution, if, 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 you, if you take out a certain kind of uh, uh, ways to approach it, for example, one way of approaching it, it is that who will lead this anti-caste democratic revolution, if at all, we ask the question. Then there was a certain kind of, you can say, Marxist position. And in Marxist position, uh, those who only uh, will, uh, will uh, can say, carry, the vanguards only, only will be working class. And it will be in the still working class. Plus, Comrade Shrat Party takes out uh, the theme of Ambedkar. Ambedkar in fifth volume has explained that how uh, the caste should be fought, how we, we should somehow take on caste. And there he has uh, given a, a kind of uh, a map or a certain kind of design where he says that uh, Dalits particularly would be the vanguards of the anti-caste revolution. Then he says that OBCs would be the, the, the other ally. Then he says that there would be uh, the working class and women. And then he explains out that uh, in particularly the struggles, particularly the Telangana struggle or in other struggles, the women, the low caste women, the untouchable and tribal women became the vanguards. So he argues that uh, in uh, anti caste revolution, uh, women, particularly low caste women, the uh, untouchable women and tribal women will be the vanguards of the revolution. So he was, he was, uh, you can say, putting up uh, Ambedkar's idea and developing it. And he also said that the Dalits would be the vanguards of the anti caste revolution. So, in that sense, he was building this idea around uh, Ambedkarism. Second aspect of it very clear to us that what, what exactly has to be done. So the, the, here one has to understand, Ambedkar ha was talking about that uh, the caste is a notion and it is, should be, it, it is not like a barbed wire. It is not like a certain kind of structure made by brick, uh, which you can remove, you can, you can demolish. This is a, a notion. And how to demolish this motion, how to annihilate this motion. And you will find that, therefore, Congress Sharat Party takes out Prabodhan as the mode of fighting against caste. So if you, you have to go for anti caste revolution, you have to uh, carry out the Prabodhan. And this Prabodhan has to be laid. And therefore, uh, Congress Sharat Party was, uh, you can say, offering this particular kind of, we can say, proposition that not only the conscious will be uh, changed, the subconscious has to be changed. To bring out anti caste democratic revolution, uh, you have, you should be very conscious and you should consciously uh, think about the ways to uh, annihilate caste from the subconscious. So this is a certain kind of, we can say, way he was uh, uh, can offering certain kind of uh, kind of programs where uh, uh, Prabodhan becomes a kind of becomes important uh, uh, mode to fight against caste. Thirdly, the, this economic agenda, largely, and this economic agenda, as I already spoke to you, has to be uh, redistribution of land, as it was a Marxist kind of very core idea of Marxism, where that uh, the, the land should be redistributed. Equitably amongst the other. Comrade Sharath Patil adds uh, anti caste kind of tinge, anti caste age to it. And does, does he, in a certain way, offers. There are other kinds of aspects of it. He, he insists that there should be a law, law, uh, uh, annulling uh, caste. So it, it is, he said that they, there should be a law. Zati. Uh, Muktisa Kaida has to be there. 
and so in that sense he also talks about the gender element the important kind of contribution we make about the whole aspect of fighting as patriarchy so he lineage he takes the lineage from the earlier kind of dynasty to till now and so he unfolds this whole kind of caste and linkages between caste and patriarchy and takes out this whole kind of struggle as the struggle against caste patriarchy in, 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 there are several other things which he is talking about uh um sir uh, we have uh, santosh suradkar has raised his hand he is a assistant professor uh, do, do we have any brief comment like if you can just unmute yourself and ask santosh ji um okay so like uh, we'll just take the last question uh, it's from ram prasad joshi uh, can we say regardless of what marx and other marxists said about india that sharad patel's interpretation of history and current caste class structure and dynamics of indian society and essentially historical materialist interpretation among the best one of its kind are historians of different persuasions trying to ev- evaluate his voluminous work in this way um uh, this is the last question sir and we'll be ending with uh, like last uh, remark from uh, professor uh, sharad waskar sir uh, so it's a long question if you can see it in the chat box if i if i'm not able to put it correctly like uh, he's saying um, is the uh, sharad patel's interpretation of history and current class class ca- caste class structure and dynamics of indian society and essentially historical materialist interpretation and among the best ones of its kind hello uh yes i think you are mu- muted i'm uh, sorry uh, uh, uh one thing is very clear that uh, uh any kind of position which commercial party is making should be uh, seen as relatively means compared to the observation compared to the understanding com- compared to the kind of can say ways to approach it is better comparatively it doesn't mean that is the last and i have some kind of objection and indecision about taking out any ideology as the last philosophy particularly marxism has conceived articulated its idea as last philosophy where we should not even confuse even comrades patil as the last philosopher uh, in amongst all kinds of we can say ways to approach uh, materialism particularly historical materialism he has uh, made a certain kind of uh, contribution where because of him we can now uh, look at the uh, institutions like uh, re institution like uh, patriarchy institution like the uh, tribe institution like uh, others as a ex- system of exploitation domination in that sense uh, it has a certain kind of universal kind of uh, proposition second thing one has to understand that uh, the kind of pragmatism uh, and the reality where you are taking out certain kind of ideologies for example he takes out Uh, the kantian position of knowledge it takes out certain kind of kind of position which which later on was developed and was combining together and uh, was explaining about this whole conscious subconscious epistemology quite a kind of you can say a uh, different proposition and somehow developed proposition that doesn't mean that is the only you have your own kind of choices you have your own kind of ways to do it and you can somehow furnish it you can enhance it and enrich it so comrade sharad patel has made a certain kind of uh, observation about uh, the great buddha buddha said that uh, you should take kind of uh, truth from me uh, you should you should follow the the the, the dhamma which is which is having a certain kind of uh, connotations of your time those who with the part of me which is doesn't have connotation to your time should not be accepted by you similarly uh, things have been changing and uh, the, the reality is always changing and the kind of manifold kind of ways reality has to be understood 
and therefore i will definitely say that uh, it is relatively a better kind of proposition but that is that is the only and the last you definitely can argue with him you can have disagreement with him can dispute with him and can develop it further um yes sir. so we are uh, like just ending our session just we have a uh, question from the chair himself uh, sir sir do you want yourself to put it the question or like uh, we can end it uh, i think uh, sajid i think uh, professor bagade has already read the question because he somehow he was it wasn't a question uh-huh. it was a presentation uh, the sense because uh, sharad patil belonging to the political tradition in the sense that uh, uh, Yes, because the political is always going to be dynamic, ever changing, contingent, heterogeneous. So the propositions propositions are also going to be that uh, in that way uh, uh, dynamic. And so Sharad Patil is someone who belongs to that tradition in which we think that uh, there is no infallibilism, there is no end of history. Uh, or having said all these things. it was just a provocative question to uh, bagade sir who already i think he's already uh, answered do we sense those tendencies or traits in the last sharad pady like towards the end that when he is rhetorical declamatory so it was a kind of a provocation uh, ha, yes, so you yes. Uh, yes and no <laughs> i would definitely say yes and no basically because i know that what exactly uh, you, you you are saying i agree with you that the kind of dogmatism kind of rhetorical kind of position he was taking he is repeating himself many times in his books as well as speech uh, some kind of we can say dogmatism is already there and we we, we know that there was dogmatism in his kind of thinking however i have as personal kind of we can say interaction with him i i, I have seen him changing for example i have written a kind of piece criticizing him in our uh, journal where i i, I have brought out kind of we can say points like uh, what is what is uh, con- uh, subconscious uh, there is no kind of explanation from you what is conscious uh, uh, your criticism of um, uh, pedagogy criticism is Uh, giving up the whole kinds of insight and theory to learn more correctly with those without learning more correctly we cannot move forward and discuss revolution so by uh, renaming it by some trans marxism you are taking a departure from it and so many questions i posed to him and the good part of his kind of uh, interaction is that he was very open and he he has answered our all points of theory however our dispute remained our disagreement remained but he was a very open and democratic personality and one has to see that uh, although uh, 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 the kind of uh, the tendencies which you have pointed out were there uh, he was still a kind of man one one should can see to inter- as we can see for interaction and debate the wonderful kind of thinker and very open for example uh, once i spoke to him about ramayana mahabharata i say that the kind of excavations uh, brought out by different kinds of archaeologists the uh, the chronological system has to has to be seen differently for example uh, the yamuna kind of we can say uh, and ganga the ramayana Uh, takes place in the kind of vicinity of ganga and mahabharata takes in the vicinity of uh, yamuna so yamuna has the ancient kind of history you can say history and uh, relatively to uh, the yamuna ganga because ganga was largely uh, forested at that early time and there was no civilizational kind of element there it was later uh, kind of colonized so this is a certain kind of we can say proposition so what exactly you are talking about rama as earlier and krishna as later on the this whole kind of scheme of your uh, criticism of mythology is uh, it is not tenable and things like that i have seen that he is patiently listening to me and was responding however his ideas had not changed but he was open to the ideas which others were offering as as a disciple of him i will definitely see that most democratic guru he was so on that note 
I will see that, yes, I observe the tendency. Yes, I also observe the democratic kind of, we can say, for this thing. Uh, so we are to, uh, towards the end of our session. Uh, I thank both of our speakers, like uh, uh, Professor Umesh Bagde, who, who, who spoke so extensively on the topic, uh, and Professor Sharad Baviskar, sir, who chaired the session and uh, made some useful comments and intervention. Uh, I also thank uh, all those who put your uh, I have put your questions in the chat box uh, for the, most of them were like very meaningful questions. Uh, so we would have really liked for uh, Professor Umesh Bagre to have to come in JNU and like interact us with us physically and like long talks were like, uh, but like the present situation demands that like we conduct the sessions in online medium. Uh, so which is not much of comfort to everyone, including the speaker itself. Like, uh, so I'll be, I will be ending the session and like I, I once again, thank everyone for joining and putting your questions and like, uh, and uh, most of us, like importantly, the both of the speakers for giving almost two hours of their time. Uh, I thank I once again thank and will now end the session. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Hmm? Thanks. Good night, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. <clears throat>